Good morning. It is so nice to have each of you here with us this morning as we continue in our study of the 8th century B.C. prophets in the Bible. Today, we're going to look at the prophet Hosea, who was a prophet to the, the northern king kingdom of Israel, the 10 northern tribes. Uh, and uh, Hosea had... Uh, I'd left no doubt in chapter 3 that the 10 northern tribes of Israel and anyone for that matter should ever view God as the everlasting accommodating husband who would always forgive no matter what. God's patience with and and his continuing their continuing sin has a limit. Uh, there is coming a day for every single person where they will be held accountable before the Holy God. And that day was looming on the horizon for every single person in the 10 northern tribes of Israel. So now let's go to, we're going to go to Hosea chapter 4, verse 1 to begin there today. And uh, before we begin, let's let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for the scriptures that you've given us that show us, Lord, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That you treat you treat every person in every country across this world the same way, exactly. And Lord, we we would just ask that you would guide our hearts. This morning, as we look at this passage, Lord, help us to see the application in our day and time, and Lord, help us to move closer to you as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Hosea 4, verse number 1. Get my computer set here. All right, here we go. We read, Hear the word of the Lord you children of Israel, for the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. Hosea stood before his people as the legitimate prophet of the Lord and thus spoke the actual words of God. We see his, him say, hear the word of the Lord. God's case concerned each and every one of the children of Israel. Note, God did not call them his people. He instead called them the inhabitants of the land. As we saw in last week's lesson, God had warned Israel through Hosea that he was breaking his covenant with them because they had turned away from him and he was and he was going to take their land away from them when the people of a nation become secular and pagan like Israel at that time and the USA today by the way we need to hear words infused with the power of God to confront the people with the sins that are ravaging their country. When these eminent words come from God, serious charges are about to be uttered by him, followed closely by his righteous judgment upon the whole nation. God gives a three-part indictment against the people of Israel. Number one, God says, there is no truth. What that means is there's no personal integrity in the relations of one person with another in their nation any longer. Number two, there is no mercy. There was no loving kindness between the people of that country with one another. Number three, there is no knowledge of God. Now, knowledge of God has two aspects. The first is having an understanding of God's nature, primarily 
This knowledge comes from God's Word, the Bible. The second aspect of knowledge of God is having a personal experience with the living God, to know God personally, to be keeping ourselves in a right relationship with God so that we are hearing His voice and we are obeying Him and living according to His ways. Then God tells them, there's no truth or mercy. Let's come down to verse number two. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing, and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. God here is exposing the moral decadence of the people shown in the list of specific sins and deep-rooted spiritual and social problems. The Israelites, and increasingly Americans, showed no real interest in knowing God and equally little interest in knowing or following God's written word, the Bible. Go to verse 3. Therefore, the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Even the fish of the sea will be taken away. God's love is a tough love, but it is built on discipline. He will not stand idly by while those called by his name retreat further and further into sin. God was sending a catastrophe that would result in making a whole land of Israel desolate, most likely a war or a plague or a famine. We see that written in Hosea chapter 2, verse 3. We also see that same warning, which we talked about several weeks ago during the prophet Amos study. In Leviticus 26, 14 through 26, says this is how God typically deals with his people when they turn away from him and go into habitual sin. Now let's come down to verse 4. Let no man contend or rebuke another, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. In the Hebrew text, the wording of this verse is difficult to follow, and thusly the verse has several different translations. Now God places a large part of the blame for the nation's perverse culture squarely on the shoulders of the priests. This is like in our New Covenant day with God, God places the responsibility for the place where America is today squarely on his church. His priests, we're not doing our job. We're not telling our children about God. We're not teaching and telling our next door neighbor about God and God's blessings that come with faithfulness to him. Consequently, through Scripture, God's priests are to lead people to faith in God and to teach obedience to God's Word to His people. And this happens by teaching the Word, like is happening right now. You are sitting, listening to me, look at this Scripture, and we both learn about the Word in the process. We need that, and every person needs that who has ever lived on this earth. Let's come down to verse 6 now. God says, my people have dis are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being a priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also 
will forget your children. Under the new covenant, in Jesus Christ, we read in 1 Peter 2, 9, every believer in Jesus Christ is a priest to God and is held to the same responsibilities as the priests under the old covenant that we're looking at here in the days of Hosea. Come down to chapter, let's go down to verse 7. The more they increased, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame, says God. Let's, let's go now to the new covenant and let's look at something very similar in what Jesus had to say to each of us who is a disciple of him. John 13, 16 through 17. Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who set together than he who sent him. Okay. Nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Okay, so we look at the New Testament, the New Covenant in, in the Bible, and we read the things in the New Covenant. Oftentimes we might say, oh, well, that, that, old, that Old Testament stuff doesn't apply to us anymore. Well, it does. And that's what we see as we look at the New Testament. We see that it all still applies in our day and age. What is wrong is wrong, and what is right is right. And the Bible very clearly divides that line between the two, between right and wrong. And Jesus says the same thing. He says, if you've, if you've listened to my teachings, he says, then, then I am going to send you out into the world and tell you to put them into practice. Just like God did through his priests under the old covenant. We need to go out and put these things into practice. God tells Israel that because they had turned their backs on his rules for living, he was going to change their glory into shame. God would bring defeat and destruction to the nation by withdrawing his protection from their enemies. Israel was about to face the terrible consequences of their betrayal of God. God's love is a tough love down to verses 11 and 12. Now God is going to, going to address the idolatry of the people of Israel. Okay, and, and as we saw in the first three chapters of Hosea, God equates idolatry or idolatrous attitudes in our, in our ways of living as being as being prostitution and turning away from love of God to love of something else. Okay. Another translation for prostitution is harlotry. Okay. So God says here, harlotry, wine and new wine enslave the heart. Harlotry here, he means to be what we would really call the illicit sex. Okay, but it also is is the attitude of turning away from God's ways. It's a betrayal of God, just like a a spouse would betray his or her spouse. My pe God says, my people ask counsel from their wooden idols, their idols, and they and their staff informs them. In other words, their staff speaks to them for. The spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray. And they have played the harlot or the prostitute against their God. The nation which turns away from God 
and becomes a secular society will claim that they do not believe in God, but they will continue to turn other places for their, quote, divine help. And they will turn to idols in place of the one true living God. The people of Israel had turned to divining rods. Their staff informed them rather than consulting God's authorized means of revelation, as we see in God's word, his written word, the Bible. Americans have turned to many, many idols, astrology, mediums, New Age spiritualism, universalism, sex, gambling, drinking, drugs, hunting, racing, sports, yeah, all of the, any number of these things can become an idol to an individual such that they are obsessed with this above the Almighty God, who is a God of love and a God of blessing. A spirit of idolatry, whether that be spiritual or sexual, has led whole nations away and, and made them obedient, disobedient, I'm sorry, to God in every way. Go to verse 13. God's Hosea says about Israel, they offer sacrifices on the mountaintops and burn incense on the hills under oaks, poplars, and terebinths because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters commit Har harlotry and your brides commit adultery. You know, we, last week in our in our first three chapters, we talked about the, the, the bride that that Hosea took, and that she apparently had had become involved in the in the the prostitution sect of Baal, and sexual prostitution was a part of the act of worship of Baal. They would go up on these mountains, they would offer sacrifices to Baal, and then they would have sex orgies. And and the picture here is is even worse. This is of a, a, a husband and a wife bringing their adolescent daughter to one of these meetings and encouraging her to prostitute herself in this horrible practice of worship of Baal. Can you imagine a parent that would do this? And, and we see a picture of the, of the betrayal and the, and the turning away of, of everything that is good in this kind of a life and turning away from God in his ways, especially. Let's go to verse 14. God says, I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, people who do not understand will be trampled. The men were the ones that were perpetuating this. And the men would stop this te these terrible practices that the whole thing would end. But the men were participating in it. They were encouraging these things. And so these daughters and these wives were becoming just like Hosea's wife. We come down to chapter 5, verse 1. Hear this, O priests, take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for yours is the judgment, because you have been, made, been a snare to Mizpah and a net spread on table. God could be saying, hear this, O priests of the United States of America. Give ear. Give ear, Mr. Congressman, who sits in Washington, D.C., 
for your turning away will be punished. God will bring judgment, and you will lose all these things that you cherish so much and you worship in place of the one and only true living God. Coming down to verse 8, God continues, Blow the ram's horn in Gibeah, the trumpet in Ramah, cry aloud at beth Avon. Look behind you, O Benjamin, Ephraim, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. Now, Ephraim is the largest and the dominant tribe and the location of the capital city of the 10 northern tribes of Israel. Okay. To blow a ram's horn is to sound the alarm that a terrible danger, an army, a flash flood, a lion, etc., was approaching the town or the city to warn people to, to take cover and to get away and to take shelter. God's judgment on the 10 northern tribes was approaching. And God is calling to the people one last time. Repent and believe in the Lord and be saved. God is saying the same thing to the United States of America today. He is telling us that our day of judgment is approaching. And that we should repent and believe. It was only by God's power and production and protection that we won the last two world wars. Now that we've turned away from God, it may not go the same next time. Let's come down to verse 13. When Ephraim saw his sickness, okay, Israel began to see the buildup of the powerful and aggressive nation of Assyria to their north and east. This is their, quote, sickness that is going to kill them. When Ephraim saw his sickness in the nation of Israel, building up his power, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jarib. Okay. He cannot cure you nor heal you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and take, tear them and go away. I will take them away. No one shall be rescued. I will return again to my place. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Now, let's talk about this. God is, is saying that the time is very near for the judgment of the nation of Israel. And as I just said, the time is very near for the United States of America also. In 722 B.C., the army of Israel was utterly defeated in the Jezreel Valley, and its capital city of Samaria fell after a terrible three-year siege at the hands of the Assyrian army. A person... Now, in their day, everybody was terrified of a lion. And in our day, they are they should be, okay? If you're out hunting or something or in the woods and you see a, and you see a mountain lion, you better try to get as far away from that lion as quickly as you can because if that lion wants to kill you, he will kill you, okay? And they knew that of a lion. And, and so the picture here is, or Ephraim, or or Israel, the ten northern tribes, it was like it was like 
a lion attacking them. They were going to, when Israel came upon them in 722, they totally destroyed their nation, took all of their men into captivity in Assyria and in the media, and they never came back. They gave their, their cities and their farms and their wives and daughters to Assyrian men who came in and took over their land. And God says, it's going to be like a young lion to the house of Judah. Now let's let's think about that for a minute. A lot of people you know, see a you see a kitten, you know, and it's so cute and it's so small and and it and it it's it's fun to play with them and to have them around. The same is true for a young lion. Okay, now they're as big as a full grown cat. Okay, a full grown cat can put a a big heavy duty scratch on you if it wants to, okay? But when these young, these people, some people, and they still do today, I've heard stories about them, they bring this lion kitten into their home or a tiger kitten, and they think it's so cute and they let it grow up in their home and they think they're, they've taught it how to, how to, you know, respect them and, and it's not gonna hurt them and they taught it not to, but, you know, time after time after time. When that lion or that tiger grows to adulthood, it will maul its owner, its master. And this is what happened. It's going to happen to Judah. Judah is not going to be taken into captivity forever. But they will be conquered and taken away. But God will allow them to come back. Okay. So they're like taking a young lion. It, Right that at this time with this warning, they're taking a young lion into their house. Okay. And and God's just warning them, you know, this young lion of idolatry that you're picking up and walking away from me is gonna someday kill you. Okay. In chapter six, we get down to the, the crux of our lesson here this morning. In verses one through two, we read, This is Hosea speaking to the people of the 10 northern tribes of Israel and of the tribe of Judah. He says, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Here, the prophet Hosea makes a final plea to his wife and his children and to his nation of Israel. The Hebrew word used here for return is shuba. The word used most often and is translated most often in the Old Testament as repent or turn back. Turn back before it's too late. Repent before God's judgment comes. Hosea is pleading with his wife, his family, and his nation to do a spiritual about face and to follow the Lord in faith for the rest of their lives on this earth, to avoid the judgment of God, the terrible day of judgment. Hosea knows that the Lord is gracious and willing to show mercy to each person who will show a sincere repentance to him and strive to walk in faith in the Lord. The God of Israel for the remainder of their lives. For he has torn, but he will heal us if we will repent and believe. He has stricken, but he will Bind us up, United States of America, if we will but repent and believe. In verse 2, Hosea prophesies of a day in the future. We see this prophecy spoken of in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, where Paul says, as it says in the scriptures, the Lord Jesus died on a cross for our sins, but was raised up on the third day 
Listen to this. God the Father. Look at look at verse 2. God the Father, after two days in the tomb, will heal the body of his own son, Jesus, the Messiah, and will revive him, raise him from the dead. And on the third day, he will raise up that we may live in his sight. God is gracious to us under the new covenant also and is willing to forgive and restore those who will repent and believe in his son, Jesus. Even for those held in captivity, the Lord will revive them to a covenant relationship with him. He will bind up their spiritual wounds in, in verse 514 and will heal them. The Lord promises to resurrect those who have turned their lives over to him and his son to return and to bring them into his eternal kingdom. In those same days in Judah, the prophet Isaiah was preaching these same promises. In Isaiah 61, 1 through 2 is a passage that is a quotation of the Messiah to come. And we see in Luke 4, 18 through 19, we see Jesus, the Messiah, speaking these very words from Isaiah 61, 1 through 2, where Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Wait, I've got this. I can show it to you. There we go. But let me start over again. Jesus is speaking, and Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty of the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now, this these are words that come directly out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was preaching these same words about the Messiah at the time that Hosea was preaching to the northern kingdom of Israel. And he was talking of a whole nation of people who would repent of their sinfulness to God, say, I'm turning away, I want to turn away, but Lord, I need your help in doing this and place their faith and their trust in the perfect sacrifice provided by God's Son, Jesus, on the cross. And that's the reason Jesus, he speaks of himself now to us in our day as having provided that perfect sacrifice with his death and with his resurrection after three days because of that death and resurrection, our sins have been atoned for. All we need do is accept his free gift by repenting and believing in that sacrifice provided by Jesus. And Jesus is saying, I've come to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all those who mourn. And who will repent? Okay, morning is repented. Repenting. We also see these prophecies confirmed in the new covenant in and through the Messiah Jesus by writings of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 3 11 through 13. Paul writes, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, 
so that he may establish your hearts blameless in the holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all saints. Now, we look forward to that day when he comes with all the saints because that is our resurrection day. That is the day that we will receive our resurrected bodies and live eternally with him as he comes from heaven with the resurrected saints who will be resurrected first. And after he arrives here, those of us who are still alive will be resurrected as well. Okay, now we go on and we see a description of the return of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapters 19 and 20. And in chapter 20, we read about following the return of Christ in power and for judgment. We read, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. This is the first resurrection at the return of Christ. Over such second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. We'll talk a little bit more about the thousand years later, but what the important thing is, is be a part of this first resurrection. Because the second resurrection is described in Revelation 20. Those are the people who never repented and believed and will stand guilty before God on his judgment day and will be cast into hell. So we, you want to be a part of the first resurrection. Repent and believe now. Let's come down to verse 3 in chapter 6. Let us know. Let us Pursue the knowledge of the Lord. He is, his going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain uh, to the earth. In verse 1, Hosea had told the ten northern tribes of Israel to repent and return to the Lord without delay. Do it now before it's too late. Here in verse 3, Hosea calls Israel to pursue the knowledge of the Lord or as translated in the Christian Standard Bible, strive to know the Lord personally by having your sins forgiven so that there's nothing between you and him that comes through repentance and belief in the sacrifice provided by his son. If, if the people of Israel would return to the Lord and strive personally to know him, then they could depend on him to return and to spiritually heal them just as assuredly as the dawning of a new day. It would be a new day for Israel. The Lord's return would be as refreshing and invigorating as rain on a, a barren land. Israel needed to know that their false fertility gods could not do what God would do for his people if they would just repent to God and to strive to know him as the Lord. God is not the one who brought about this rift. If Israel wanted to experience intimacy with God, then they would have to repent of their sinful worship of idols and personally turn to God in faith in his covenant with them. Now let's come down to verse 4. O oh, Ephraim, okay, that means he's speaking to the ten northern tribes of Israel. What shall I do to you? O oh, Judah, this is the southern tribe of Judah. What shall I do for you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, like the early dew, it goes away. Ephraim was always the predominant of the ten northern tribes. It was the location of their capital city, Samaria. In Genesis 49, 8 through 10, and in Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it is prophesied that Judah was to be the tribe chosen by God to be the tribe of the kings of united Israel and the tribe through whom God would bring the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, and the new covenant 
with Israel. God expressed his frustration with both Ephraim and with Judah, asking of both, what shall I do with you? God uses the same metaphor of each half of the nation. Your faithfulness is like a morning cloud and like the early dew that goes away as soon as the sun comes up. God's love for all his people has always been unwavering, but their devotion to him was fickle. God continually offers his people words of hope in spite of their unfaithfulness. If we will but repent and turn to lives of faith in him. The Hebrew word in verse 4 translated faithfulness in the New King James and love is kessed, which is God's covenant love toward his covenant people. The Hebrew word carries both the meanings of faithfulness and of love, okay, and is almost you is used almost exclusively in the Old Testament as God's kind of covenant love that he pours out upon the people who place their faith and their trust in him and follow him. God's kind of faithful love for his covenant people is so unique that it is translated in the NASB as an invented English word, loving kindness. Loving kindness, the kind of love that God shows to his covenant people. Verse 5. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth. And your judgments are like light that goes forth. Now, because of the of the of collective Israel's unfaithfulness. God had sent his prophets like Amos and Jonah and Hosea and Isaiah and the, and the prophet we're going to study next, Micah. He sent these prophets to hone or to reconstruct the faith of both Ephraim and Judah. To hone means to chip something out of rock and make it into a, a shape that's, that's beautiful. And, and something that a person would want to keep. The meaning of the Hebrew word for hewn or cut them down, as it is translated in the Christian Standard Bible, can be likened to they didn't have a leg to stand on. In other words, there was nothing the people of Ephraim or Judah could do or say to refute the accu accusations that the prophets brought against them. The last Hebrew phrase of verse 5 literally reads, with regard to your judgments, light will go forth. The New King James translates as, I have slain them by the words of my mouth. God is speaking. And your judgments are like light that goes forth. Christian Standard Bible translates as, I have killed them with the words from my mouth. My judgment strikes like lightning. The prophetic utterances shed light on the darkness of the people's promiscuity and their unfaithfulness to the Lord. The light of God's holiness and perfect justice exposed depravity, the depravity of their sins. These numerous prophets sent from God to both Ephraim and Judah was yet another expression of his mercy and his love for them, giving them multiple opportunity to repent and to turn back to godly ways of living as specified in his written word, the Bible. Then God would have forgiven them of their individual sins. For each person that would repent and believe, God would wash their sins away. And they would be restored in their relationship to him, the holy God, and put an end to the punishment that was justified in their sin. Now look at verse 6. God says, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. At best, the people of Israel and Judah 
misunderstood the sacrificial system. At worst, they used it as a way to try to manipulate God. The sacrifices were the outward expressions of an inward reality, expressions of devotion to the holy God and realization of their, their of our profound sinfulness, as we see also in the New Covenant in Romans 6.23. It says the wages of sin is death. What we've earned by our sin is death. Okay, the New Testament says that as well as the Old Testament. Okay, again, the Hebrew word translated mercy here is kesed, which is a covenant love and a desire for mercy from God based on faith in him, faith in the sacrificial death offered for the sins committed. This occurred in the Old Testament days only within the temple, on the altar in the temple that stands in front of the Holy of Holies, which is God's place of residence. We can't go move toward God except that that sacrifice covers our sins. Okay, God desires faithful love and a desire for a personal relationship with Him, walking daily by faith in His written Word, the Old Covenant monotheistic law, or the New Covenant New Testament. Romans 6.23 says, if we read the whole thing together, it makes more sense. But, and let's, let's go down to that. As I said before, just like in the Old Testament, the statement, the wages of sin is death. What we've earned by our sin is death, eternal spiritual death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in the perfect sacrifice for sin provided by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now let's come down to verse 7. But like men, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt treacherously with me. Okay, me being God. Okay, so it's capital M. Gilead is a city of evildoers and defiled with blood. As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. Verse 7 is connected to verse 6 that we just looked at by the universal Hebrew conjunction, which is wa, and is therefore God who is speaking in connection with the thought that the knowledge of God is more than just burnt offerings. Okay. The Hebrew word translated men in the New King James is literally the singular form of Adam, meaning either the proper name Adam or all of humankind. Okay. The Hebrew word translated transgressed here in this passage, in this verse, means to knowingly and deliberately cross over the line of God's written law, just as Adam had done in deliberately disobeying a direct command given to him by God in Genesis 2, 16 through 17, where God said, you can eat of all of the trees of the garden except for this one. And in the day that you eat of this one, you will surely die. Okay, you will earn death. That will be your wages that you earn by eating of this tree that I've forbidden you to eat from. The Hebrew word translated treacherously here means to knowingly and deliberately cross, I'm sorry, transgress means to knowingly and deliberately cross over the line. The word treacherously is translated betrayed in the Christian Standard Bible. In eating the forbidden fruit, Adam had betrayed his trust in, by God. Okay. Each one of us 
has betrayed God's trust in us by our sin. And we have thus earned spiritual death. The prophet Hosea makes the point that a person who is truly living in personal covenant with God does not habitually behave contrary to God's written moral laws. Instead, a person living in covenant with God will quickly realize his or her sins as they occur and feel convicted to come before God repenting and seeking forgiveness for these sins. At this point, Hosea was led by the Lord to single out the city of Gilead as a place in Israel which was particularly sinful and treacherous. The city of Gilead was located in a rugged region east of the Jordan River and the north central highlands, which was also called Gilead. These highlands were also called Gilead. Gilead had a number of connections with Jacob. Hosea said that Gilead was a city of evildoers, defiled with blood. Christian Standard Bible reads, tracked with bloody footprints. Now, this shows the connection with Jacob again. Now, all of the people of Israel were descended from Jacob's 12 sons, who were the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay. The root word for the Hebrew word footprints is yak which is the root word for Jacob. Y-A-C-O-B is the root word for J-A-C-O-B. Okay. <clears throat> the root for the Hebrew word evil doer, doers is the same root word as Beth Avon, the term Hosea used to describe Beth El. Bethel is the place Jacob met God when he was fleeing from Israel. And by the way, this is when the place where Jacob repented to God and received forgiveness from God, such that God did not motivate Esau to kill him. At this point, it seemed that the nation of Israel was acting as selfish and devious as their father Jacob had lived up to that point. And he was a devious guy. Verse 9. Next, the Lord turned Hosea's attention to the way to Shechem, located in the hill country of Ephraim, on the slopes of Mount Ebal, the location of the first capital city of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Shechem was, the be was best known as the place where Jacob's daughter Dinah was raped. And in retaliation, her brothers, Simeon and Levi, slaughtered all of the men of the city. After that, the rest of Jacob's sons plundered Shechem in Genesis 34. The Lord described the priests, the descendants of Levi, as calculating and bloodthirsty men, waiting to ambush in ambush to commit murder, just like Levi had done at Shechem years in the past. This, by the way, is the priests of Israel who were descended from Levi. God holds them responsible, just as he holds his priests of this day responsible for not sharing the truth of Jesus to our neighbors. This demonstrates that Israel's spiritual leaders were as evil as anybody else, like Jacob and his 12 sons, who were the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. And as the priests were the people commissioned by God to teach the written law to the nation of Israel, this can largely account for the major reason why the entire nation was transgressing the law of God in such an unbridled fashion. They were not familiar with God's law and had no respect for it whatsoever. Let's come down to verses 10 through 11a. God says, I have seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is 
the harlotry of Ephraim, Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you. What the Lord saw in the house of Israel was a horrible thing. There's the harlotry of Ephraim, Israel is defiled. The Hebrew words used here describe Israel as a young virgin giving herself over to prostitution on the high places of the Canaanite gods. But God says, oh, Judah, before you act self-righteously in pronouncing judgment on Israel, know also that a harvest is appointed for you as well. It would be 120 years before the first deportation of exiles from Judah into Babylon. Once again, the Lord was giving ample warning to Judah for repentance to keep this from happening. Now let's come down to the second half of verse 11. When I return the captives of my people, when I have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered and the wickedness of Samaria, for they have committed fraud. A thief comes in, a band of robbers takes spoil outside. Using three main proper names for their nation, Israel, Ephraim, and Samaria, God brought these accusations against the 10 northern tribes. Number one, they have committed fraud against each other. Number two, a thief comes in to people's homes. Number three, a band of robbers takes spoil as people travel. Look at verse two. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now that their own deeds have surrounded them, they are before my face. In their folly, the people of Israel failed to consider that God was watching them all the while. God has witnessed how their entire society was consumed with sin. By failing to recognize this truth, Israel failed to consider what a holy and just God would do in his response to such wickedness. And what was the cause of all of it from the very beginning is they had no trust in God. And in, in chapter 7, Hosea sums it up this way. They make a king glad with their wickedness and princes with their lies. They are adulterers. Woe to them, for they have fled from me. Destruction to them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeem them, yet they have spoken lies against me. They do not cry out to me, and their heart, when they wailed upon their beds, they assemble together for grain and new wine. They rebel against me. Though I disciplined and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like treacher a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the cursings of their tongue. This shall be their, dis their dis derision in the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, we... We lift up our hearts to you, Lord, asking for forgiveness of, of our failings to teach our nation your word as written in the Bible. Lord, we ask that you would give our nation another chance to repent and believe, just as you did Israel, that you would... Allow us, Lord, to put the word out there by every means, by speaking to our next door neighbor, by broadcasting it on the Internet, by speaking from every pulpit 
in this country and on every street corner. Lord, help us to take the good news of your son, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, to our nation. And Lord, we pray that you would soften their hearts when they hear the word, the truth, the hope that we have in Jesus as our Lord. Lord, guide us in all we do. Lord, we, we ask that your will be done. We ask, Lord, that you would go with us as we live our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So nice to have each one of you here with us today. Hope to see you back here next week. Same time, same place.